Today we're talking about chapter 13, the care of birds, reptiles, and small mammals. So exotic animals. Um, again, we have learning objectives on the care of birds, and then we're going to have learning objectives on the care of reptiles. I'll be going over in more detail anatomy and physiology of birds and uh, reptiles and amphibians um, in a later class and also some common diseases. Um, but I want to go over uh, primarily um, what we see them for um, and how we see them in a veterinary clinic. So starting out, birds are the third most common small animal pet. Um, they can make really great pets. Uh, approximately 85% of presenting disease problems is a result of the lack of basic nutritional and husbandry requirements. What does that mean? People don't know how to take care of exotic pets. And this is not just birds, but um, it, when we see reptiles. Uh, and so it's really important that we understand where these pets come from, what, they're, you, what they should be eating, um, what their environmental needs are so that we can educate. So you as the veterinary technician um, can take that lead in being the information resource. When they, uh, when animal, uh, people transport birds to us, they should be in a cage, a carrier, or plastic small animal carrier. They should never be unsecured. Obviously that's unsafe, the bird can fly away. Um, the cage should not be cleaned because um, it's really important for us to see the waste or what we call mutes. Um, and to see how the bird is cared for, because remember, environment and nutrition is um, a, a good point, 85% of what the, the problem typically is. Um, we do want to remove cage grit when we transfer, transport them. Uh, we want to bring in a medication, vitamins, and a sample of the food that they're eating. It's also really helpful to have a cage in which you can place a perch uh, so that they are more comfortable. Um, I do warn people when they are transporting a bird in an emergency that most birds don't survive the trip to the um, animal hospital and that unless they're used to being transported, just the stress of um, packing them up and putting them in a car and bringing them into the clinic can be enough to kill them. So I am very cautious when I talk to people that, has a, that have a bird that is very, very ill. Um, or is an emergent situation that it is possible that just transporting them um, is it can be uh, cause sudden death. Part of this is that owners don't often recognize early signs of illness. So often the birds are much sicker um, by the time they get to us than um, than they otherwise might appear to the owner. Um, so this can cause a sudden death. Um, so first we want to get a clinical history. So what is their chief complaint? Um, often it's that they appear fluffed up, they're not eating, or they're sitting on the bottom of the cage. So that's our chief complaint. That's what we have to have to deal with, but it doesn't give us a huge amount to go on. Um, we need to understand their species because it tells us nutritionally what they um, require. Um, and their also their uh, species also tells us behaviorally what we should be expecting. Um, their gender, if they know it, not all birds um, show their gender um, by their outside covering. Sometimes we have to do a DNA test in order to determine gender. Um, their age. Uh, age, is, age can be a really important indicator of what might be going on. Um, origin. Where did they come from? Most birds are captive bred. Um, it is illegal to transport uh, birds um, to the United States as pets at this point. Um, their environment. Where do they live? Where in the house do they live? Do they live with other um, cage mates or even other birds in the room? Um, access to um, UV light, uh, you know, the, the drafts that go through the room, all these are really important. Um, diet, appetite, feces, we need to look at uh, what they are, what's coming out of their body. Um, their cage mates, the molting cycle. So have they molted lately? Have you seen a lot of feathers? Are they picking feathers? That kind of thing. What's their behavior and then any previous medical history? We have to remember uh, that when we're examining uh, these guys, they can get very, very stressed very quickly and we could kill them. So we have to be very careful with them. Um, it is really helpful if we're going to capture them that we um, do so in a darkened room. We can see much better in the dark than these guys can. And most birds uh, tend to um, decrease their um, biologic rhythms as the sun goes down, right? So the most, most birds are diurnal, meaning they are active during the day and quiet at night. So when it gets dark, birds get quiet. So if we can use, have a darkened room, um, that can be really helpful. 
Using a towel instead of your hands can be helpful as well. We do not want to associate them, uh, hand, our hands with them being um, being restrained, captured and restrained, because people want to put their hands in their cage and not be bit um, and not scare their animal. So using a towel can be helpful. Using positive reinforcement with most birds can be helpful, but it does take time to gain their trust. Um, they are definitely prey animals, um, so we have to be careful, uh, or most of them are. Um, using a bird restraint can be super helpful, especially with larger birds, um, can keep their head and neck uh, nice and safe and their beak away from you. And then you want to confine their, their wings so they can't flap them and hurt themselves and their legs. Um, we cannot press on their wings because if we press on their chest, it will keep them from being able to expand their chest, which they need to do so in order to breathe. This other instrument here is called a speculum. Um, this allows us to slide it into the mouth and turn it so that we can open the mouth and see in there without getting um, our fingers bitten off. Um, stool evaluation, pretty important. Um, so a normal stool are going to have some pasty urates. These are the white stuff here. Some liquid urine and some fecal material. This tubular greenish brown stuff is, to, is fecal material. So all those, all three of those things will come out of the cloaca, which is the, the opening of the digestive tract and the urinary tract at the rear of the bird. Um, they can get polyuria, so they can get, um, uh, they can urinate a large amount of liquid uh, urine, so we, we can identify that. We can also identify diarrhea. If this is not a nice tube, that indicates that we have diarrhea. When we are looking at a fecal exam, uh, first of all, we look at it, and then secondly, we're going to do a direct smear. Um, a lot of uh, giardia um, and protozoa are we're able to find with just doing a little bit of the fecal material on a cover on a slide with a little bit of saline. We can see movement of um, bacteria. The slide should be warm when we're doing that for reptiles or birds. Um, it keeps the the uh, one cell to organize it, uh, organisms active, so we can see them moving. Um, we can also add some Lugol's iodine if we want to uh, contrast um, whatever's moving in there. So this is an example of a Giardia. Uh, it's a flagellated um, amoeboid um, organism that can cause some pretty severe um, diarrhea. Um, we can also do a float, uh, just like we do with small animals. Uh, we can do that with birds, and uh, we can look for capillaria, which is a um, fluke. Um, and some uh, ascrids, which are roundworms. So this is a roundworm, and we just use it, uh, use the float material as we would with a small animal. Um, sedimentation can be really important procedure to concentrate um, flukes, the, the capillaria, because they are heavier uh, than uh, most float solutions. Um, gram stains. Gram stains are really important in reptiles and um, birds. So we do do sometimes do gram stains on um, on small animal uh, fecal to identify bacterial flora, but it's a lot more important with reptiles and birds because of their diets. Um, so it helps us um, per, um, kind of get a basic idea of what's going on with the bacterial flora. Also, we can find gastrointestinal candidiasis, which is a yeast infection that can cause a lot of problems. It actually can cause a lot of problems with humans, but we don't look for it um, often enough. Um, but we do see this in humans. Uh, we see this in small animals. Uh, we see these in birds, um, but, but a lot more in birds. But this is a fungal spore. Um, and you can see these uh, fungal spores and fungal branching here. And if we see that in the feces, that's abnormal. Most caged birds have gram-positive organisms in their digestive tract. So remember, gram-positive organisms should be purple. So we should see a mostly purple digestive tract. If, they are, if we don't have a mostly purple digestive tract or bacteria in the digestive tract, then we may have an issue. Um, they don't have the right flora, so we want to give them um, the right probiotics and, and postbiotics or whatever in order to make sure that they can digest their um, food appropriately. This is an example of a, uh, looks like a uh, waterfowl, actually, because we have webbed feet, uh, and doing a cloacal swab. And we can do this on cytosine species as well. Cytosine species are species like this. So parakeets or parrots, um, macaws, those are all cytosines. Um, but birds doing a cloacal 
uh, evaluation is sometimes something that we need to do in order to look for inflammatory cells or culture insensitivity, looking for chlamydia, um, or doing a viral isolation. So just an example, this person's taking blood, this person's restraining, um, and this person's doing a cloacal swab. All right, so we can do, we also need to do an oral examination, especially if the animal is having difficulty breathing or has any discharge on their series, which are these little um, nasal openings up on the top of their beak. Let's go back to this picture back here and see if you can see them. This little hole right here, that's called a series, like a nares, but a series, C-E-R-E-S. And if there's discharge from there or they have discharge from their beak, we need to look at their coena. Difference, coena versus cloaca. Cloaca is in the rear. It has an L, cloaca. Coena, H and an N, and that is in their mouth. And this is the opening between their uh, nasal passages and their mouth. So if you think of the back of your mouth and if you have a cold and you have discharge running the back, down the back of your throat, you get a strep culture. That's a similar thing. A coenal culture is when we see something with an upper respiratory sign. We want to do a, we want to open their beak as wide as we can. Look for that slit above, here's the tongue. Look for that slit above the tongue and stick the swab directly in there. We want to avoid all the other oral uh, membranes in here, we don't want to get cross-contaminated. So directly into the coena, coena, okay? The other thing we can do is a crop wash. A crop wash is um, when we stick a tube, a soft flexible tube, into the esophagus. We want to avoid the, the uh, trachea, which actually is fairly easy to do. We just go up and over the tongue and avoid the trachea um, and directly into the crop. And you can actually feel the crop on the outside neck of a bird and uh, you can determine how deep you need to stick that tube. Um, what we will do is uh, infuse a little bit of saline then suck the contents out. Um, that helps us to um, take a look to see if there are any cells like protozoa. Um, <clears throat> we might find trichomonas, candida yeast, or look for some heterophils, which would be some neutrophils, uh, or some white cells that we might see and indicate inflammation or infection. We do a culture sensitivity on this. We do have to be really careful. We don't want to obviously don't want to put saline uh, into the trachea. and We don't want to damage the crop at all. Tube feeding is something that is very commonly done with hand-raised birds. So um, how do we tube feed? Now, the average person can do this. Here is the glottis, and a lot of times the, the glottis is, is just that opening into the trachea, and sometimes it will actually have a, a split glottis, so they can make different sounds, um, and is directly down right over the tongue. If we go to the um, right, the bird's right side, so your left, but to the bird's right side, um, we can go directly into the esophagus. The esophagus leads us to the crop, which then goes through the rest of the intestinal um, tract. Um, we, uh, this is how little baby birds are hand fed. They use little tiny tubes. Um, the birds get really, really used to it, open their little mouths. Um, honestly, uh, adult birds very often will do this as well. They stick their beaks right um, over, their, over the baby birds' uh, tongues and directly into their um, esophagus and uh, insert the food themselves. So it's kind of, it's, it's pretty similar to what a, a mama bird would do. So we can do that. We can then medicate the bird that way. We can give them nutrition that way. We do want to make sure that we insert it in the right place. Uh, we want to make sure the temperature of food is not too hot, not too cold, and that we have a, um, a diameter, a tube diameter is larger than the glottis. So if the tube is bigger than that glottis, there's no way for us to put it in the wrong hole. And obviously we don't want to overfill the, the crop. Venipuncture sites. So we do get blood from birds. We do have to be careful when we get blood from birds, but it is fairly easy to do. This is somebody doing a one-handed technique. They're getting blood all by themselves. They're restraining the bird and they're getting blood from the bird. Um, we obviously need to be careful with the, um, the size of the birds, the weight of the bird. We don't want to get more than 1% of their body weight. So we do have to get a small amount, but here's a video you can show yourself uh, about getting blood 
Um, so it's important to understand the, the two most common places to get blood. The right jugular vein, the right jugular vein is the recommended site for most species. And this is the right jugular vein. This is somebody getting the jugular from the jugular vein. They just separated the, um, the feathers and put a little bit of alcohol. Really easy to see. Um, this, the second place is the basilic vein. The basilic vein is here on the inside of the wing. And they probably plucked a couple of feathers here just to show it a little bit more clearly, but it is just running right over the elbow um, right here. And it's a fairly good size uh, vein uh, to get blood from. The medial metatarsal vein is another place if you want to get a real small volume or in a larger um, patient. And metatarsal means it's on the back foot. So it's the back hawk and it's on the inside, that is medial, so it's on the inside of the back hawk. Okay. Um, using a restraint board for larger pets, like that picture I showed earlier, is a really good idea. Radiographic positioning. This is some. This is a skill that if you get into the program, this is something you'll actually have to do. Um, this is a really important diagnostic tool. Um, when we t take X-rays of birds, we need to make sure that we can see both sides. Uh, and that they're not overlapping each other. So the way that we do it, it's obvious when they're on their back, it's you just spread everything out. When they're on their side, we need to put the back wing, the bottom wing in front of the upper wing and do the same with the bottom leg. So we're going to tape them in position. Obviously, most of these birds, unless it's a pigeon, um, they tend to be pretty, pretty docile or a dove is pretty docile. Um, but most of these birds are going to need to be sedated um, or under anesthesia in order to do this. Okay, um, so we have lateral view, a ventrodorsal view, and then if we need to do a specific extremity, we can do that as well. So here's a ex uh, picture example of radiographic uh, positioning. Um, the other thing I like to do, I don't like sticky tape, so I will fold the tape. Um, and use it more as a rope um, than, uh, than as something sticky. Um, so I'm, I try to be careful with the feathers because otherwise you'll pull them out. Um, but this is one way to do it. Um, this animal is on a plexiglass board on top of um, an x-ray unit and obviously they're under anesthesia. Um, your job typically is good restraint and these the bigger the bird is the harder they are to restrain but you can see this person is doing just fine they have a little um, wrap um, around to control the wings so they don't have to worry about the rings they are controlling the head by not crushing the neck but putting their hands behind the mandibles if you control behind the mandibles and the back of the head you control the head and also they're controlling the legs um, so here's a restraint board as an example. It's a plexiglass board with some place to put their neck and um, keep their head away from you and then tie their, their uh, wings and legs down. Um, we can do things like a laparoscopy, um, which is looking inside the abdomen, doing an endoscopy, doing tracheal washes, air sac washes, biopsies, cytologic examinations, bone marrow aspirates. Often you're going to find these things happening in specialty clinics. Um, we do have one or two clinics that we work with that will take students and that you will be able to work with birds in this way. So if that's something that you're interested in, you do want to let us know so we can get you in those clinics. Anesthesia, we're going to use a gas anesthesia, usually isoflurane or even better, sevoflurane. Um, and use it with oxygen as well. Uh, can put them in an induction chamber or mask them down, and then we can intubate them by using a small tube right into their glottis. Do have to be super, super careful not to put too much pressure uh, into their lungs because we can really uh, expand their lungs too much. So I'd be very, very careful. Um, we will need hemostats uh, to put these tubes in because we don't want to put our fingers uh, anywhere no near those beaks, even if they, we think they're asleep. Um, when we administer medication, sometimes we do it in the food or water, but that's typically uh, unreliable. So we like to use liquid suspensions that we can drop right into their beaks. Um, we can give injections. If we're going to give injections, the best place to do it is in the large pectoral muscle mass. 
um, the basilic vein uh, on, the, on the inner arm is what's recommended for IV drug treatment. We can also give sub-Q fluid. This person is pointing to the inguinal region where there's some skin available for sub-Q fluid or in the axillary region between the wing and the body wall. Wing clipping is a technician job. This is something that you should be able to do. We want to um, clip both wings so that they're symmetric. Um, if they are heavier birds, we can just get away with doing the primary flight feathers, which is typically the first five, five feathers here. If they're lighter birds, we have to do both the secondary and pr um, primary feathers because they can get up off the ground or, and soar. Our goal is flight restriction. We're not preventing them for, from flying completely. We want them to be able to soar to the ground. So if they take off, off their cage, we don't want them crashing and burning. We want them to soar to the ground, uh, to glide. Um, so we want to clip them. Um, uh, we want to look at the veins of each um, uh, feather that we're clipping to make sure there's no blood coming up into those uh, veins of the feathers. When they're when we do have we do clip those, they need to be the blood needs to be stopped, and that does sometimes happen. Nail trimming they have really long quicks, and so often what we'll use is a Dremel motor tool, or we'll use cautery to clip them. And just burn them off. Uh, we can do the same with the beaks. The beaks often need to be trimmed, especially if they're on the wrong diet. Um, wrong diets can cause abnormal beak growth, and so we have to either drill, um, cut, or cauterize uh, the beak as well. Dietary management. So keep the cages clean so they don't have to, they don't uh, ingest their own feces. That's important. Monitor food consumption. A lot of people think that they're feeding the right foods, which a lot of people think that birds eat seeds. Not all birds eat seeds. Um, some birds require mostly seeds, but also require some other um, protein as well. Um, but an all seed diet will lead to um, fatty liver disease and uh, early death and just a poor overall body condition. Uh, so we want to make sure that they're getting a good diet for their species. Um, really hard to get um, birds to switch their food, so we have to do it gradually because they do need to eat regularly. Um, it's pretty common for people if they're seed feeders um, to not pay attention to the fact that birds will eat, leave the holes of the seeds in the food bowl, but eat the inner, and so the food bowl will look full, but they're not. It's they're actually starving to death because they're not actually. Uh, feeding them regularly. So we want to make sure you're, you're giving small amounts um, and emptying the food bowl regularly and refilling it. Um, tube feeding is pretty common uh, with hand raising uh, birds. Start with small amounts pretty frequently. Uh, you want to weigh the bird one to two times a day and make sure that they are um, gaining weight. So again, seeds are not necessarily best. If it is a seed-eating bird, like a finch, that might be best, but occasionally they may need insects. Um, I usually recommend a commercial pelleted diet. I don't usually recommend something that looks like Fruit Loops. Um, this, this colorful diet is visually appealing, uh, but it's not natural uh, and can lead to some issues, uh, especially if there's some sensitivity to food dyes. Um, it is important to, to give them calcium, especially female birds uh, need calcium, so it's important to have some mineral grit. Um, making insects available can be really helpful for a lot of different types of birds. Um, insoluble grit um, is used in the ventriculus um, in order to uh, digest things and in the gizzard. Um, soluble grit is digested, it's a mineral source. Um, this is an unhealthy looking bird. Actually, this is an unhealthy, sorry, unhealthy looking bird. This is a healthy looking bird. So we have dull hair coat, broken shoulder feathers, uh, discharge caked in the nares, elongated and flaking beak that bleeds easily when trimmed, peeling feet, greenish, uh, blackish green color to the wingtips. This bird and this bird might be the same bird, but this is months after um, switching to the right food. So nutrition is really key. Um, Harrison's bird diet is one of my favorites. Another one is Zupreme. These are two really good bird foods that are pelleted and are very specific to different species of, of bird. Um, so you get different sizes, you can get different um, 
makes. <laughs> uh, and it's really important to get the right one that's recommended for your bird. Uh, again, you have to switch them over slowly. Um, one thing that we did with a bird that I had is we made bread um, from this Harrison's and we put some other stuff in the bread that were, and it gradually got the bird used to the taste and that it was easier to switch her over. Water is the single most important dietary component. You should remember that. So you should have it easily accessible, not in any location that's going to allow feces, feathers, or food particles to accumulate. So it should always be above, near or above food bowls um, and attached to the walls of the enclosures. We don't want large water bowls um, or water bowls where they're just going to swim in that they also have to drink out of because that's not, not ideal. Hospitalization, uh, we want a separate room for these birds that is climate controlled, that has a visual barrier um, between uh, birds and other species. It has disposable perches, it's clean, temperature control, um, no sudden changes between in temperatures, usually between 80 and 90 degrees for a bird that is um, hospitalized, uh, but we do want to watch for any signs of heat stress or shivering. Some uh, two important avian diseases I want to talk about, um, Chlamydophila psittaci, um, it's called psittacosis. Uh, we don't see it as much anymore, but we can see it in other countries or if you have a wild caught bird. Um, it's bacterial, it's zoonotic, and it's potentially fatal uh, through inhalation of the um, the feces, the stuff in the feces. So if we have a bird with psittacosis, we need to isolate that bird and um, use gloves, masks, dispose of the feces. Um, uh, pet care workers um, were required to wear these and if they weren't um, educated properly and were not wearing gloves and masks when they were taking, taking care, care of these pets, pets um, could, could be, uh, get, get very, very sick, sick very quickly. quickly. Um, neurologic uh, uh, concerns, seizures, um, paralysis, paralysis and, and death. death. And, and so, so it's a, it's a real, real important thing. That's part of the reason that, that um, birds are now um, uh, supposed to be all handier in the United States. This uh, Bornavirus is a relatively newly discovered uh, virus. It's actually been around for a long time, but we couldn't figure out what was going on. So um, it's an RNA neurotropic virus that is contagious in some way, but we're not sure. We think it's an STD or through placental transmission versus direct contact. Um, it's, it's very, very common, common in domestic species. species. Almost every uh, animal in the United States is has it, and it's zoonotic, but it's not zoonotic to humans, so zoonotic to other species. The bird does not need to be isolated. There are two forms. The proventricular dilatation is progressive and fatal. Um, they, is, essentially, they starve to death because they're proventriculous, which is their um, true stomach, distends and isn't able to digest food. So they'll eat, but they won't be able to digest their food. Um, the second form is dermatologic. So it's a feather plucking disease that is treatable unless they pluck their feathers to the extent that this bird did, in which case this bird uh, is uh, no longer has feathers and can no longer uh, grow feathers because of the damage that, that occurred. Okay, okay, that, that was first. first. Now we're going to talk about uh, reptiles. So the rest of this um, is essentially on reptiles. Um, frogs and toads and salamanders are not reptiles. They're amphibians. Um, turtles are um, colonians. Uh, so it's important to know they're, they're reptiles, but they're colonians. So it's important to know those differences. So for a technician's job with a reptile, you should be able to handle and collect diagnostic samples. Not everybody's going to be comfortable with this. Not everybody's comfortable with birds, but it's important that you know how to do this. Um, re required medical and surgical equipment for handling reptiles would be a gram scale, an incubator, because we need to keep that they're exothermic, or yeah, exothermic, so they rely on the environment for their um, body temperature, a heating pad, Tuberculin and microliter syringes, so really tiny syringes, an exotic animal formulary. We need that with any exotic animal. That's a drug formula. It tells us drug dosages for different medications. Microhematocrit tubes, rubber mouth specula, or a spatula, so we can open up the mouth gently. A snake cloacal probe. That's probably the one thing that's a little bit more difficult to find. Um, it helps us to sex animals and to understand what's happening within the cloaca. And then metal feeding tubes. Um, 
housing equipment must be adaptable because not every reptile looks the same. Some have legs, some don't. Um, with snakes, we want to have a snake hook, tongs, plexiglass tubes. It allows us to um, examine the snake um, through a clear tube and to restrain them without uh, danger. And then a pole snare can be helpful too for larger reptiles. So again, ch uh, clinical history, start with history, similar to birds, their chief complaint, their species, gender, and age, their origin, their environment, their heat source, where are they getting their heat source from? And uh, we don't like heat rocks anymore. They, they cause burns, heating pads cause burns. Light, UV light, and how often has that UV bulb been changed? Food, what kind of food are they being fed? Water, feces, their cage mates, behavior, shedding, and any previous medical history. Shedding is like molting in birds. Um, so they do need to shed on occasion uh, in order to grow and to uh, maintain health. Uh, fecal sample analysis. Again, we want to do a GI, uh, we're looking for GI parasites or um, uh, abnormal bacteria. We can look under a wet mount, which is that direct smear, saline smear on a, um, on warm, on a warm slide. We look at a flotation, so um, regular flotation, a sedimentation, looking for flukes. A colonic wash may be the only way that we can get uh, a sample because reptiles don't necessarily eat every day, depends on the reptile. Could be weeks since the last time they've eaten. Snakes, often they come in because they haven't eaten in weeks, and so they're not going to have a stool sample. Um, so we often have to lubricate a tube or a catheter, inject some sterile saline, a little bit of saline, um, and then um, pull that out and uh, look at the cells. Some other things we might do, bone marrow analysis, a stomach lavage, urine samples on turtles and lizards, but not snakes. Snakes don't have bladders. So if I ask you how to get a urine sample on a snake, you don't. Um, uh, turtles, if you pick them up, they may void. So it's an easy way to get a urine sample. Um, blood sample. I'm going to give you another slide uh, for some details on how to get that. Most blood samples we take through the tail vein, um, the coccygeal vein or the caudal tail vein. Uh, radiography, um, skin specimens, sputum specimen um, for fungal and bacterial culture. Sputum is anything that comes out of the nose or the mouth. Uh, blood sampling. So there's a lot of variation between uh, snakes, lizards, turtles, crocodilians, small lizards. Um, so we want to be, first of all, careful not to get, take more blood than, than is necessary. We need to know what kind of sample we need or how much we need, uh, depending on our, what diagnostics we're doing. Um, so a lot of them, we do a tail vein. So you see tail vein, tail vein, tail vein. Um, we could do a cardiac puncture. With turtles, we could do a jugular vein. Weird place to do it is occipital sinus. So the occipital bone is in the back of the skull. Right below that bone, there is a sinus or an accumul uh, uh, like a cystic structure in which blood accumulates. With small uh, lizards, we might go beyond, behind the eye, a peribulbar or retrobulbar plexus. Again, there's an accumulation of uh, blood vessels back behind the eye where we can get some uh, blood sample from. So here's an example of doing a caudal tail vein. It's on the ventral side of the um, of the tail. It just takes a little practice to do. Here's an example of radiography. Um, can be useful if we're diagnosing reptiles. We're going to take at least two views, but in turtles, we also want a frontal view as well. So here is a frontal view where we're looking straight down um, at uh, down the center so that we can see the lungs on top and look little follicles little ovaries uh, in the this female turtle um, so we can get a turtle to go up on a um, pvc or a um, cup a styrofoam cup and they if their legs don't touch the ground they can't move um, and we can do them on their side and we can do them up straight up and down um, let's see uh, with a snake and put them in a pillowcase and try to just make sure they're not looping over on themselves to make sure they're nice and fat, flat. Do barium studies so we can um, tube them, to uh, put a tube into their esophagus and give them barium sulfate. To, this makes a really um, clear delineation of the digestive tract. Uh, but we have to be uh, understanding that the GI transit times are long. 
If a snake doesn't eat for two weeks, it's going to take a while for barium to get through its system. So days, not hours. Um, anesthesia. Uh, gas anesthesia is not usually recommended. They just they the respiratory system is just a little bit different in the way that um, they they can hold their breath essentially for long periods of time. So um, so it's it's a lot harder to to do it with gas anesthesia. Um, injectable anesthetic agents are often used. Uh, we can intubate and assist ventilation if we need to, but we're not necessarily um, going to uh, maintain anesthesia with gas. Okay, so uh, if positive pressure ventilation is when we bag them, so we push this little bag and inflate their lungs a little bit. We have to be real careful with that, though. Uh, lizards, we can use gas anesthesia. Um, to uh, but we usually induce with an injectable anesthetic agent, but not propofol. Um, with snakes, we want to use a dissociative agent. A dissociative agent is something that separates their brain from their body, uh, so they don't—they're not realizing what's going on. Um, we we don't recommend it for invasive surgical procedures. In that case, we're going to switch to inhalant anesthetics um, for general procedures. Uh, we may need to do positive pressure ventilation, which means we're going to bag them to inflate their lungs. And uh, when we recover them, we want them in a darkened, heated environment. Reptiles require controlled microenvironment. The thing is, they need a range of both temperature and humidity, so they, they can choose based on their body needs. Do I need to digest or not? What temperature do I need to be at in order to uh, regulate my metabolism? Um, so we're not going to go above 90 degrees. We're not going to dip below 75 degrees. And humidity is going to be... Um, different based on species. So knowing your species in the environment they come from is really key. Um, tube feeding uh, is an important technique that we often have to d use. Uh, we want a well lubricated tube, pass it all the way down to the stomach, which is uh, beyond the first third of the uh, animal. Um, this is a, using a plexiglass tube, so if the animal goes up to the, to the top and you hold on to its, um, uh, its tail, it can't go all, all the way through, um, and, but it can't bend back on itself. And so it's kind of stuck in that position, so you can use something to get that tube in there. Um, we, there are very specific diets for reptiles um, that make it really easy to, um, to feed them in a hospital environment. Uh, flukers, Reptaid is something we used to use very frequently uh, that was very helpful. Um, you could uh, put a certain amount of the powder with a certain amount of, the, um, of uh, water and feed them a very specific amount of nutrients. Injections. Here's, a, here's something important. Injections should only be given on the cranial half of the body. So we use the apaxial muscles, which are the muscles along the back, along the spine, or the forelimbs in order to give injections. So really important with reptiles, cranial half of the body. We never want to give anything nephrotoxic in the caudal third of the body. So we can give fluids in the caudal third of the body, but nothing that could could be dangerous to the kidneys because there's just a way that blood flows through the kidneys that could be a lot more dangerous. Uh, oral medications through a stomach tube, and we usually do it uh, via liquids. We're not going to pill a lizard or a snake very well. Dietary deficiencies are not common in snakes, but they are super common in lizards, turtles, and crocodilians. Most of the animals that I saw in practice had metabolic bone disease. Um, this is due to a low calcium intake, a low vitamin D3 intake, which is um, they can get nutritionally, but also through UV light exposure, or an excessive phosphorus intake, meaning they're feeding too much phosphorus per the calcium that they're taking in. Um, if we, we can prevent this with a suitable diet and exposure to ultraviolet light that is full spectrum, both AVA, UVA and UVB. Um, Colonian nutrition, so the turtle and tortoises. So land tortoises need vegetables with some fruits and limited high-protein foods, so maybe some maggots now and again. Aquatic turtles eat whole animals, insects, no meats, 
and vegetables in small amounts. So a lot of people used to feed hamburger, raw hamburger to their turtles. Um, this can cause a lot of problems with the water quality and introducing um, parasites and bacteria to the turtles. Uh, so we want to feed them just what they're going to be eat. They need to be fed. Aquatic turtles need to be fed in the water. So they can eat this aquatic turtle food. They can eat fish. They can eat maggots. They can eat insects. Um, but just the amount they're going to eat, they tend to be pretty dirty. Um, and so maintaining their water environment is very important. Snakes are carnivores. They, um, they are obligate carnivores, just like cats. But they do need a varied diet, and eating whole foods <laughs> is the important thing. Rats, mice, gerbils, rabbits, chickens, lizards, fish, um, fish for aquatic snakes, and other snakes are all part of their normal diet. The size of the meal is what differs. So the size of the meal needs to be the same diameter as the body or an eighth of their length. And so you have to measure the snake in order to understand what size you can feed them. We want to feed them once every one to two weeks. We feed them more often when they're babies and feed them less often as they become adults. But usually it's uh, every two weeks. Do you want to uh, weigh them periodically? And we want to make sure they have fresh water on a daily basis. Most lizards are omnivores, meaning they'll eat uh, other lizards, they'll eat insects, um, they'll eat um, vegetables, uh, fruits, and, or fruits and vegetables as well. Um, uh, we do want to nutritionally supplement the diet. Um, there's a difference between juveniles and adults. Juveniles are going to need a much higher protein and calcium content. There are some herbivorous uh, lizards um, as well, so lizards that only eat um, veggies. Uh, and you just need to know your species. Commercial food is available. Here's an example here. Iguanas, and uh, ju juveniles are going to need more protein and calcium than adults, like I said earlier. And obviously these guys need plenty of water. Salmonella. Salmonella is part of the normal gastrointestinal flora. Um, and so these are all examples of things you need to be careful of. Do not kiss your lizard. Do not allow your, your children to handle um, uh, reptiles without washing their hands. Don't put them near your mouth. Um, basically, they shed the salmonella in their feces and it covers their bodies as they move through it. So you want to make sure the reptiles are nice and healthy, that you have good hygiene, and you always wash your hands. Please don't kiss your lizard. All right, moving on to the small furries. Ferrets, rabbits, hamsters, gerbils, guinea pigs, rats, and mice. So this is really basic information. Ferrets are pretty popular. Um, they can be a lot of fun to have, um, but there's some dangers in having the very curious animals that get into anything and they put lots of things in their mouth. So we see a lot of foreign bodies with these guys. Um, vaccines. Ferrets do require vaccines. Um, they get a canine distemper and ferret safe rabies. We have to very, have a very specific rabies for ferrets. Most ferrets will have allergic reactions um, that are diarrhea and nausea within 20 minutes. So we want to vaccinate them and keep them in the hospital for at least 20 minutes after vaccinating so we can give them some Benadryl or some, or some uh, steroid to limit <clears throat> the vac uh, vaccine reaction if they have one. Um, so distemper should be um, boosted yearly or every three years. And then uh, rabies is also uh, once a year or every three years. Nail trims, uh, we can teach the owners how to do this. We usually use like cat uh, type nail trims. Um, if we're gonna get blood, uh, the most common place that I would get blood was the jugular vein but you could also get it from the crane, uh, cranial vena cava, which is, to me, a little scary. It's a little deeper um, than the uh, jugular vein, um, but it's, it, it comes down here over the, the sternum a little bit uh, versus the jugular vein that goes up the, uh, the neck. Um, and then we can also get it through the cephalic vein, and we can place a, a cephalic um, IV catheter as well. Um, ferrets are also... Um, carnivores, they have a slightly different um, protein to fat ratio that's necessary um, for, than a cat food, than most cat foods. You can use a high quality cat food, but a ferret diet is, um, is probably a better idea. Um, Marshall uh, ferrets, Marshall ferrets are ferrets. Uh, there was a, there's a big company called Marshall ferrets. 
believe it's upstate New York, um, that produce ferrets and all ferret-related things. Um, most really, um, people that are really into ferrets don't recommend Marshall diets. I'll just tell you that. They also don't recommend buying ferrets from Marshall Farms. Um, these ferrets are come from a pretty narrow <coughs> gene pool at this point. They all get similar diseases. They all have a similar lifespan, it's usually about seven years. Um, whereas if you get a ferret from a private breeder, um, especially one that has English um, roots, uh, those guys tend to li live about 15 years, and so they're longer lived, tend to be a lot healthier. Um, so they are carnivores, 30% fat, 25% or 30% protein, 25% fat in their diet. Uh, don't want high fiber. Want to be really uh, careful <coughs> with their diet and provide a lot of fresh water. Um, like I said, they too, do tend to get into things. Um, foreign bodies are pretty common for these guys. Anesthesia, um, there, there's not a lot that we need to do anesthesia for ferrets. Typically, they will come to us neutered and spayed um, but if we will, and descented. Um, but if we needed to do um, for a mass removal, um, I've done uh, adrenalectomy on a ferret before. Um, I've done... Um, uh, we could do a dental cleaning or if we need to um, sedate them for anything else uh, we're going to use an induction chamber so put them basically in a glass aquarium um, insert uh, gas into there um, and then intubate them if they, it's going to be a longer procedure we do want to fast them for about five hours beforehand um, sometimes we can hide medication in food um, but liquid medications are easier to administer this is an example of some, of, of ferret with a mask anesthesia and we're taking blood from the um, cranial vena cava. Estrogen toxicity. We don't see this often because as I said most ferrets are spayed by the time you get them. It is a potentially fatal disease um, that occurs in females as a result of prolonged estrus. Once females go, ferrets go into estrus, they do not come out of estrus uh, for a long time. They will not come out of estrus unless they are bred um, have uh, intercourse with a male um, or have uh, offspring, in which case afterwards they'll go into estrus again. So it's just safer to spay them. There are toxic effects of estrogen on bone marrow. It causes severe anemia and thrombocytopenia, which is um, loss of uh, platelets, or they don't pr produce platelets. Um, what we will see is hair loss and a swollen vulva. And we can see this in... Um, in dogs and cats with prolonged estrus or um, ovarian cysts as well. So you see this, this is an, uh, any loss of hair like this, it's going to be an endocrine disease. In this case, it's estrogen toxicity. Treatment would be spaying. Um, uh, any animal that comes to you spayed or neutered should have a tattoo uh, in the ears. Human influenza, ferrets are susceptible to human influenza. Um, they show clinical signs of respiratory disease, nasal ocular discharges, coughing, sneezing. Um, we do want to differentiate it from canine distemper or bacterial pneumonia. Basically, we treat that uh, symptomatically just like we do our own flu with antihistamines and decongestants. Um, not the same medications. You can go to your vet and get those medications. Um, some other problems. They are more susceptible to heartworm disease than dogs. They do, mosquitoes do come into the house and they do bite ferrets. Um, so we, having them on a uh, heartworm medication can be helpful. Um, and I believe you, they can take the smallest dose of um, ivermectin, um, which is um, heartworm, heart guard. Um, Fleas, they can get fleas. Uh, foreign body ingestion, like I said, they're putting things in their mouth all the time. Um, neoplastic diseases, this is one of the things we see because, because of genetics. They get adrenal disease, insulinoma, and lymphoma. So, uh, so adrenal um, disease typically is a, an adrenal tumor. Uh, insulinoma would be an, an, um, a tumor of the pancreas or a tumor of the lymph uh, nodes. Those are the three things we see. We see it at about age six and a half, uh, and they uh, typically die pretty quickly after that. Hypoglycemia from either diet. They have a very fast metabolism, so they need to eat frequent, eat every day, um, and they need to not have diarrhea because they can get hypoglycemic. Um, also, if they have an insulinoma, that can also lead to hypoglycemia as well. 
because it's an overproduction of insulin. Canine distemper vaccination, so they do get canine distemper, so we want to vaccinate them against that. Um, a rabies vaccine and TAG, uh, because they're ha um, and they're, they are highly susceptible to vaccine reactions, so we want to fast them, make sure they don't um, vomit or have diarrhea, and then monitor them. Rabbits. Rabbits are herbivores and they have really high fiber requirements. So we, they need to have Timothy hay or some other grass hay and a grass-based pellet, pelleted diet. When they're younger than five months, it's important to have some alfalfa hay for them as well because it has a higher protein content. After five months, it just leads to obesity. They can get some treats. Um, they should have something to chew on to wear their teeth down evenly. They should have regular feeding schedules with hay in the a.m. and pellets in the afternoon or evening and fresh water available all the time. We can put pets under rabbits under anesthesia. Um, people will tell you that it's, um, and I will tell you, uh, that they are very susceptible um, to anesthesia. So we have to watch them very, very closely, monitor them very closely. Uh, we do withhold food for only 30 minutes to an hour. And then as soon as they're awake, we want them, uh, and sternal, we want to put food in with them so that they can eat. We don't want them to have respiratory disease because um, they can't breathe unless uh, they have um, access to their nose. And so we want them to be free of respiratory disease. Uh, I've got some injectable agents in here. I'm not going to have you remember this. The big thing to remember is that their heart rate will often slow to something that is unsustainable. So one of the things we do want to give them is atropine or glycopyrrolate that will help to increase their heart rate during uh, we give that before surgery so it keeps their heart rate going during surgery. This is a, a rabbit that has been hypnotized. You can train your rabbits to be hypnotized. It does take a little bit of uh, tra training or, or socialization to this, but if you put them on their back and you stroke their stomach, they can go into a trance-like state in which they you can do a fair amount of stuff with them. You can take blood, you can trim their nails, you can um, trim their teeth, and they'll remain calm and relaxed during the procedure. Some injection sites in rabbits. Um, the dorsal surface of the ear, um, but we do have to be careful of hematomas because those are pretty fragile vessels. The central artery of the ear, um, the cephalic vein, here's the cephalic vein, just like a dog or a cat. And they have a large saphenous vein. So it's, a, it's um, higher on the leg than a dog, but it's a good place to put a catheter. Um, we do not vaccinate these guys, although there may be something coming for the, the new the hemorrhagic disease that we're seeing in rabbits. It's a viral disease that is um, crossing the world. Uh, it's very dangerous. So uh, that may be something that's coming along. Um, deworming is sometimes appropriate. They often get a coccidial um, a parasite. Um, they can get ascarids or some other parasites as well. Um, a lot of times we see dermatologic diseases. So either ears, so ear mites or ear infections, or we get the scabbiness or um, they have hair loss. Uh, they do self trauma. Um, we can see nutritional deficiencies that causes hair loss as well. Bacterial dermatitis, um, fur mites or rabbit lice are pretty common. Uh, this is a fur mite. This is uh, rabbit lice. Scabies uh, can happen in these guys as well. They can get fleas. Um, using kitten advantage is one thing that we can use on rabbits. Um, and they can get little ulcerative lesions as well. So those are some pretty common things. This is ringworm. They do get ringworm, so fungal organisms. Um, they, if they stop eating for any reason, that is a, an emergency because rabbits need to eat constantly. Um, if they get diarrhea for any reason, that's an emergency. Heat stress is really, they commonly get heat stroke and, stroke and will die. So if you have an animal that is outside, make sure you have uh, a way for them to cool off. Um, hairballs is not uncommon. We call those trichobezoars for the fancy name. So hairballs are really common. Uh, Pasturella multacida infection. It's also called snuffles because it causes a lot of discharge in the eyes and the nose. And it causes, that's a bacterial infection that can go through a rabbitry. And so you want to make sure that when you get your rabbit, it's free of uh, this disease. Um, Encephalozoan cuniculi is a neurologic disease that gets into the spinal column. 
would be a real problem. Um, this is pretty common, malocclusion. Their teeth don't line up and they're like horses so that when they uh, eat, they're grinding their teeth down. And if they're grinding unevenly or not grinding their teeth down, you can see this, this is actually going back into the nose of that rabbit. These teeth need to be trimmed these teeth need to be filed down. You see this, this is looking inside a mouth. This is the cheek. This is the tongue. Those are sharp little points that are going to cause some pain when the animal chews and they're going to stop eating. So we have to file those off, off, off pretty often like we do with a horse. Float the teeth. Rodents um, and, and rabbits. rabbits. We, we have, have to be really careful, careful with both of these guys with, with antibiotics. antibiotics. They need really good um, bacterial flora they need a lot of good gut bacteria to digest their food and if they're not digesting the food it turns into diarrhea which turns into dehydration which will kill them very quickly we call it dysbiosis when we kill the uh, good bacteria with uh, antibiotics and then they get an abnormal bacteria in there um, so we will use instead of like penicillins, amoxicillin, big no-no with rodents and um, rabbits. We'll use tetracyclines and fluoroquinolones, which is like Batril. Um, if you've heard of that before, so we use a different type of antibiotic with these guys. So it's really important that you think of using an exotic animal formulary when you're thinking uh, antibiotics for these guys. And we want to make sure they have probiotics as well. Anesthesia, um, injectable and gas anesthesia typically with these guys. Uh, and then um, we'll use ivermectin, which is a, the um, antiparasitic that is used in a lot of formulations for heartworm disease, for parasites, for ear mites. It kills a lot of parasites. So big thing with rabbits, they need hay. You don't want to give them antibiotics. They have heat stress. They need their teeth. Uh, um, uh, floated and uh, they uh, can't get in, uh, um, certain antibiotics. Guinea pigs. Um, guinea pigs have a long gestation period versus others, about six months versus, versus um, 21 to 30 days, uh, these smaller pets. Um, they do have open rooted teeth just like the rest of these um, guys. Guinea pigs are rodents. Uh, rabbits are not. Rabbits are lagomorphs, but they have very similar um, similar things going on. Um, but they, they both have these open rooted rooted teeth or hypsodont teeth that need to be trimmed if they are if they have a malocclusion. Uh, and this is the way we look in the mouth. We use an otoscope to look in the mouth and look back in there and see if it needs to be trimmed uh, or um, floated. So you can see these little sharp little points here. That's uncomfortable. It's a problem. Um, they are very fastidious eaters, so they're very picky, um, and they want things to be nice and clean. They are on a grass-based commercial pellet. They need fresh vitamin C every single day. So fresh vitamin C supplementation is really important. Um, I don't like to get the stuff off the shelf. I like to give them fresh vitamin C in the form of carrots, strawberries, or oranges every day um, because vitamin C uh, um, has a very short shelf life. So if you're buying it from the shelf, you don't know how long it's been stored there um, on, the, on the shelf at the pet store or how long it's been stored in a warehouse somewhere. So I rec recommend daily vitamin C. If they don't get daily vitamin C, they get scurvy, um, which is something that was common in uh, people uh, tra traveling on ships, sailors. If they didn't get enough fresh fruits and vegetables in their diet, they would also get scurvy. So they get a dermatitis um, as well, a foot pad dermatitis that we can prevent if we keep their enclosures clean. So big thing with guinea pigs, besides malocclusion, is vitamin C supplementation. Hamsters, they have cheek pouches for feed tra food transportation. They also have these little um, uh, alopecia spots, the little um, spots on their sides um, for marking territory and mating rituals. They're not sores, but people often mistake them for sores. Um, they do have a tendency to bite. That's in their nature. Um, they do need an exercise wheel. They have a really fast metabolism and they just need to move, move, move. They live about 18 to 24 months and their gestation period is 16 days. Gerbils are active burrowing animals adapted to the desert environment. Their lifespan is three and a half years. Um, it's common to see epilepsy or seizures in these guys. Like hamsters, they're really good at escaping. Um, they have a similar diet to hamsters. 
Uh, they can get nasal dermatitis because they burrow, so you have to watch their little noses, make sure they have nice, soft uh, burrowing material. Um, they, like hamsters, can get what we call wet tail. In this case, it's called Tizzer's disease called, caused by um, Bacillus piliformis. Wet tail is anything that will cause diarrhea, and that can kill a hamster in no time. Um, so be really careful with that. Make sure they have plenty of good probiotics. Gerbils. One, one interesting thing with gerbils and gerbil restraint. You do not want to restrain them by the tail. You can hold a mouse and a rat by the tail, but you cannot hold a gerbil by the tail. At least um, not for as long as you can hold a, a rat or a mouse. They drop their tail as a defense mechanism. So unless you want to hand back a, um, a detailed, a detailed uh, gerbil to an owner, you want to just handle them um, like this person is doing. You never want to grab them by their tail. Mice can be very aggressive and territorial. Um, they require small amounts of food and water. They are escape prone. Um, the common things we see them for would be ectoparasites like mites, uh, fur mites, and uh, parasite or uh, fleas, neoplasia, mammary glands, um, and trauma. Trauma is usually cage mate inflicted hair loss. Their lifespan is about two years. Rats are very clean rodents. They make awesome pets, and most people can't get past this tail. Um, but if you look at the tail, it's just you know that's it's just a, a bald squirrel tail. Um, if you can get past that, they make excellent pets. They're very clean. They can live up to three years. They do have a tendency to get neoplasia, so mammary glands are pretty common. Um, they can get mycoplasma, respiratory infections like tuberculosis. They very seldom bite, very seldom bite. So they make great pets for young kids, um, and they're very, very smart. So I usually, I recommend them. They're my top small animal pet by far to get. Prairie dogs. I don't know why I talk about them, but I do because I've still seen them as pets in the United States. They are illegal to keep uh, as pets here in the United States. You might see them overseas as pets. Um, zoonotic diseases. Uh, they do carry hantavirus, rabies, ectoparasites, salmonella, plague bacteria, monkey pox. So a lot of diseases that you can get. That's part of the reason they're illegal. They can live up to 10 years. Um, they do tend to get uh, obese, some respiratory disease, some malocclusion, infectious pododermatitis, which is uh, infection of the feet, um, some trauma and neoplasia. If you do have them, you want to have them on a diet of grass hay, and they're supplemented with grass-based pellets. Finally, hedgehogs. Hedgehogs are nocturnal um, spinal animals. Um, they are maintained much like rodents, but they are not rodents. They are, need to be on an insectivore, omnivore diet, very specific diet. Um, we often need anesthesia just to examine them um, because they will pull much tighter into ball. You won't see their head or, or nose or anything when you're examining them. Some common diseases would be neoplasia, obesity, otitis externa, so ear infections, Dermatitis is really, really common. Uh, so they get skin diseases. And trust me, treating a skin disease on a hedgehog is really hard to do in between those spines. They do get external parasites and respiratory disease as well. Oh, I forgot we have sugar gliders. Sugar gliders really, really cute, but they do have um, very specific needs that you need to research uh, before you uh, get one of these. They are extremely... Um, they are extremely... Uh, social animals and they will die if they don't have social interaction um, and they are nocturnal so they like their social interaction at night. Um, malnutrition is the most common problem with these guys. They do get um, hypocalcemic and hypoglycemic very easily. They need specific diets. Um, there are not any commercial glider pelleted diets readily available, so you do need to make your own. I just highly recommend that you talk with a very experienced breeder, someone who's been doing it for years and has really good um, uh, techniques. I've uh, neutered these guys before. Um, I've helped with a, a number of different issues uh, before as preventive care. They do not give vaccines. Um, they can make really good pets, but you have to be super dedicated to them. That, that kind of needs to be your life. So just, just so you're aware. Very cute, but your life. If you have any questions, please bring them to class. We'll discuss them uh, in, a, you know, in a discussion. Um, do your work, and we'll see you in class. Thanks.